In May 1960, the hanging room at Wandsworth Prison was being made ready for an execution. A member of one of London's most notorious crime families was thought certain to hang for the shooting of a nightclub barman. The 28-year-old Jimmy Nash defied certainty to escape the rope and taught the underworld how to get away with murder. He walked into the old bailey facing being hung for murder. That was what he was facing purely and simply. And instead of that, he walked out of the dock with a five-year sentence for causing grievous bodily harm on a dead man. Jimmy Nash was no ordinary defender. One of six brothers from an Islington family of gamblers, club owners and thieves. They were the most powerful firm of criminals in London. The Nashes were a little bit different to most other firms. They were respected all over. And, and you can say there was fear. There, were, there wasn't really fear from people that knew them. But they knew they weren't liberty takers. But there was tremendous respect because they wouldn't buckle down to anyone. They'd never let a friend down. The most loyal people you've ever met. Everyone rallied around Jimmy. Everyone, no one wanted to see Jimmy uh, get found guilty of a murder charge where he could have got hung. The police file is still open because to this day nobody's been convicted of the murder. It took place in the same East End street where Jack the Ripper claimed his last victim. The scene of the crime was an illegal East End drinking club. Well, the, the pen club was a squalid, dirty drinking club in Duval Street. And it was bought by two gangsters. The clientele were mainly criminal. The things that went on were the setting up of jobs i.e. burglaries, robberies, call it whatever you will. That was what they foregathered for, and also to spend their ill-gotten gains after hours. Selwyn Cooney was the barman in this dinner thieves. He shared the job with Faye Sadler, a shoplifter and gangster's mole. Cooney had had an accident in his car involving one of the Nash brothers, who came off worse than the fight that followed. In the underworld, this meant retaliation was inevitable. On February 8, 1960, at about midnight, Jimmy Nash and two other men arrived in the club. The police insist Nash had a gun. Publicly, he has always denied it. As soon as these people walked into the club, the fracas started. A man called Billy Ambrose tried to step in got between Nash and Cooney and was promptly shot in the stomach. Nash then promptly and cruelly shot Cooney. Shot him in the head. Cooney, in spite of what some people believe or have heard, did not give chase to Nash. He couldn't. He took one step forward, fell over a television set and died. The bullet was completely lodged in his brain. Everyone spilled out of the club in a panic and the police were called. Almost immediately they had three witnesses who said they could identify the gunman. Ambulance men found Cooney's body dumped in the gutter. Faye Sadler was initially cooperative, but she decided the underworld's code of silence was more important than justice for her dead friend. She told the Daily Express she would never grasp and went abroad to avoid giving evidence. To men like Mickey Bloom, there's no doubt that Faye Sadler did the right thing. He's a staunch supporter of the Nashes. If people knew of people that were going to give evidence against Jimmy Nash, or going to say, of course they'd be, be warned, you know, and be told they shouldn't do it. Because that was the code. That, that's, that's what they were supposed to do. Things happen. People get hurt. People die. All right. You know, no one likes to see someone die, but these things happen. 
I mean, the guy, whoever it was, Danny, whoever it was, he, he asked for it. He asked originally to get a right-hander from Jim. He asked for it. And so what happened to him, you know, I've got no remorse about that at all. Bert Wixton was a detective sergeant on the Pain Club case and went on to become one of Scotland Yard's top gang-busting detectives. He investigated 39 murders and reached the rank of commander. He was known as the old grey fox. Yeah. This, I suppose, you could say is the end product to everything. The manhunt. And I'll tell you, there's nothing quite like a manhunt when you've got the real thing and you've got your murder or whoever it is, you put them in there. And the next step to there is their prison sentence. Gives you a good feeling. But there was no joy for the police in the Pen Club case. The first Old Bailey trial was stopped by the judge amid charges of jury knobbling. When the retrial began, two key prosecution witnesses had been attacked and slashed in the face. This was one of the first trials where witnesses and jurors received police protection. Despite this, the judge complained that witnesses were too scared to tell the truth. The underworld had been at work. Never mind a murder case in any sort of case. If we could help them, we'd help them. It was us against them. We didn't follow society's rules, did we? We had our own rules. And people in the straight world don't understand this. Respect is not fear or threatening or nobbling or anything else. It's respect. People respected it. There were all sorts of things going on at these trials from attempted subversion of jurors to absolute intimidation of witnesses outside the court by these gangsters. Yeah, I'll tell you the truth, I tried to follow someone on the bus. You know, just to say, look, he's my mate and he didn't do it. But I, I never ever got near them, I don't think anyone else did either. The police really made a big thing out of nothing. The events that led up to Cooney's death and formed the subsequent trial for murder typified the underworld's warped idea of justice. Reasonable doubt was sown into the jury's mind and Jimmy Nash was acquitted of firing the fatal shot. He got five years for breaking Cooney's nose and escaped the noose. Oh, we were shocked. Couldn't believe it. I can't believe it to this day on the evidence as given to that court. After he went to prison, the Nashes just disappeared. Their reputation faded. They didn't come into any real big inquiries. And they had dropped all pretense of we are the bosses of London's underworld. Perhaps they'd been persuaded by the emergence of other games such as the Craze and the Richardsons and the Callaghan's from South London, they were all milling around. In 60s gangland, the North-South Divide was created by the River Thames. The Nashes were true sons of North London, where the big names in the underworld were fighters and hard men. But south of the river, villains had a more business-like approach to crime. Raised in the local criminal tradition of the dodgy deal and the contract, they were out to make money. Charlie and Eddie Richardson were two Lambeth boys who ran their own company when they were still in their teens. Charlie had the business brain. And I was buying scrap metal from various businesses and within a year I was in a fairly big way of business. By the time I was 20 years of age, who was a very well established company. From a humble start, Charlie Richardson built a thriving business out of other people's scrap and rags. He was soon running half a dozen yards across South East London. But the profits from scrap alone were never enough for him. The yards became a front for a criminal empire of fraud and violence, which eventually boasted mining interests in South Africa and an office in Park Lane. I mean, he was a shrewd businessman, there's no doubt about it. He'd money back into the scrapyard all the time. 
I mean, that bloke had a fantastic brain for buying and selling you. There's no one that could touch him. And you know, he had a lot of government contracts which through the back door, backhanders and things like that. Johnny Bradbury was a trusted lieutenant and childhood friend of Charlie's. He saw the Richardson's firm prosper in London's post-war development boom. It was the ideal climate for a shady dealer. Contracts were agreed with a handshake. Bad debts were settled with the right hand. But with Charlie, it went further. And I mean, if you wanted something, we went to see Charlie about it. If you wanted someone straightened up, you went to see Charlie about it. It wasn't a gang as, uh, like the Mafia or something like that, you know. It's, I mean, if it, I, I called you, Frank, and I couldn't get no joy, and you live in South London, I don't see Charlie. They look, Charlie, I'll give you so much out of it, just get my money back, you know, and here. Take it over from there. To help him straighten things out, Charlie recruited a man whose reputation alone was enough to promote the Richardsons into the first division of crime. To this day, throughout the underworld, mad Frankie Fraser is respected, and that means feared. He was a very strong principled man, not the same principles as the straight world knows, but principles that we understood, that we all hoped to achieve. Uh, a very powerful man, a fearless man. And obviously, when he went with the Richardsons, you know, it was like trying to get in the atom bomb. They were already a tasty firm, but him being with them, and, and he, was a, he was a big deterrent against anyone else interfering with them, whether it be the Twins or other South London firms. Frankie Fraser joined the Richardsons straight from jail in 1962. He'd been captured at Heathrow Airport seven years earlier and imprisoned for his part in a revenge attack on a London gangster. At the time, Fraser was a henchman for London underworld boss Billy Hill. When Hill fell out with his former gangland partner Jack Spot, each began plotting to kill the other. Fraser led a street attack on Spot to teach him a lesson. I just whacked him with a shillelagh and times and someone else cut him and that was that. If you'd had a knife that night, what would, would you have done? I'd have killed him. I think I would have done, yes, because I think he deserved it. Were you feared? Yes. Well, I don't think so, but this is what people have told me. And what was it in you that instilled that fear? Either you're born with it or I don't know. There's something there about it. Something that you're not in control of. It's natural, it's there. It's all I can say. With Fraser on board, the Richardsons had the might to do as they pleased. As Charlie's business expanded, he had the edge over his competitors in another way too. The scrap business had brought him into contact with corrupt policemen. Sergeants he'd bribed to ignore a load of church roof lead in the 50s had been promoted, and Charlie kept in touch. Commanders at Scotland Yard, at one time there was lowly sergeants. If we didn't pay these people money, my customers had all kind of harassment. My premises were searched, and um, I a strong form of black belt and it had to be paid. I everybody else paid the police or every other metal merchant. If I didn't pay them off, I'd have been in a very vulnerable position. But Charlie was never reluctant to pay the police. He knew it was a worthwhile investment. After policemen had visited his office, charges would be forgotten. That was how it was. We just could not with a foot wrong. No matter what police station you went to, there was always someone that our local police station knew who could contact someone there and straighten the things out. We'd tell him what it was for and he'd go and do the deal. He'd come back and say, all right, Johnny, 50 pounds for me, no 150 pounds. Just give him the money and that was the last you ever heard of anything. And that's you could not get arrested. Never. But there were some things even Charlie couldn't arrange. South Africa has been Johnny Bradbury's home since he fled there in 1964 to escape arrest. He was wanted for a type of company fraud that was a Richardson speciality. Bradbury had a flair for this lucrative crime. 
Yeah, but that big. In the early 60s, he ran a front company called Bradbury Trading. It was so successful, it became too big to cover up. This crime is still popular today. It's called a long-term fraud. A long-term fraud is getting goods under false pretenses. You get 30 days or 90 days credit. You pay for the first lot, you double your order up, pay a bit, pay another bit, then again another order, and you do six or seven firms at once. I went in bankruptcy for £28,000 and that's on the six. And that was in the case of seven months. And that was a lot of money in the six is 28 grand. It was Charlie Richardson's most successful long firm fraud. The scam was to order goods on false pretenses by setting up a network of phony companies with false references. At first, they paid suppliers promptly to win their confidence. Then they made huge orders on credit. After delivery, the fake company and the goods disappeared overnight. And everyone wanted to give credit. As long as you paid your first lot, the credit just came in. You can go to any firm. You know, we had um, leather goods, all sorts, all kinds of things. You want to go case for the week, then? This is the most marvellous thing to take with you. Yes? No? Six foot, two one six. Most of the stolen merchandise went on sale right under the noses of the police. The street markets of South London were an ideal distribution network for the Richardson's gang. The traders even told them what was in demand. Radios was the best thing to do, just started coming out. Various stall owners at the markets, because they wasn't paying tax on them. They got them, you know, say five bob cheaper, six bob cheaper, and they could get them from the wholesale company. So they was queuing up on the sets. There was no problem getting rid of them. North of the river, resentment was brewing. The craze long term frauds were much less successful. They believed they were entitled to a bigger slice of the action and travelled south to press their claim. The Richardsons were not impressed and sent them back empty handed. The key member of the Cray firm recalls how much this upset Ronnie. Richardsons were getting too much money. They were a rich firm compared to us and they didn't want to know. Clear off, we don't need them. That upset him. We used to call it Indian country. Because uh, after this meet, then the, it's off, it's hostile. If we went south of the river, we would hire a car, you know, with the purse on the inside of the door. And we'd have a gun in there. To Ronnie, it, it was an insult. They wouldn't join him. So he wanted a war anyway. Then our firm was paired off. He worked in twos. My partner was young Ronnie Hart. And we were given a target. Our target was Mottram, one of the uh, Richardson's long firm fraudsters. And we were given it all the details they can get about him. his address, his drinking habits, this sort of thing. We were all supplied with a gun. Or the, the whereabouts of a gun. You, you, I mean, you didn't walk around armed, just taking a piss, you know, you, but you knew where you could get one quick. Who would have been the targets for Ronnie and Richard? The main man, Fraser. And I imagine if it had gone on, it would have come to an actual bomb into the scrapyard, get them all in one place, or, or, or a club. Maybe. But the young Haywood did it for us. Billy Haywood was a busy South London thief. He also ran a spieler, an illegal gambling club, in a house in Lewisham. Here, Haywood's fellow thieves gambled away their real gotten games. His right hand man, who kept order in the club, was Billy Gardner. I had the drinking, drinking upstairs, the gambling downstairs. He was played by me, poker, karaoke, um, good living. Good living. The Lewisham Club was a den of thieves. Gangsters weren't welcome because the gangster did to the thief what the thief did to his victim. When you're out screwing, 
You're risking your liberty to get money. You're not going to let some bastard come and take it off, are you? You know, I mean, you help other thieves, but with gangsters, if you've got something, it's like every white title of the world. I want it. You don't want to it. To keep their money, the thieves had to be prepared to take the gangsters on at their own game. If they come up with their coat pockets, then you go downstairs, lift up the CD, and uh, how do you want to guess I've got a What was on to the CD? Uh, the arsenal. Uh, handguns, shotguns. The spiel was too successful to be ignored. It was on the Richardson's manor, but Bill Haywood wasn't paying any dues. Charlie left that side of the business to his brother Eddie, and the man in the underworld called the atom bomb. Eddie Richardson came out with Frank Fraser. And then the bit of friction started there, you know, from there. I went in the back room and then. My pal, Bill, I wouldn't do it long. About 15 minutes come out, described the woman. And um, I said to Bill afterwards, I, I went and got one anyway, just in case. I put that dandy belt in it. And it wasn't like, he said, they want a bit of the action here. What did you say? He said, no, nah, no. I said, I think it'd be some egg. He said, I oh, know. Who you with us? I don't mean, yeah. Ag, or Agro, wasn't long coming. Frank Fraser and the Richardsons wanted to see Hayward and Gardner at a nightclub in Catford called Mr. Smith's. He had a phone call. The other mob was there. Gonna smack Bill's bum. They smack his bum, they gotta smack him all. Anyway, we went up there and, uh, Three of our boys was up there. Henry Bums, Peter on the seat, Dick Yard, Bill and I had a look around. And there was about 14, 15 over there. That is two or three to one, right? You know. So you are, like, um, sent out some, for some shooters. I arrived, 15 minutes. There's one end of the bar, where's the other end of the bar? And, um, the atmosphere changed. It was, it was all nice and cool. Then all of a sudden, tension started to rise a bit, you know. Here you come up, Eddie Richardson, drink up. Don't want you no more. Put that man on the door. Uh, I said, drink up. And he said, no. Don't wait till three geezers come up and give Bill a clump of the pain it. Cross the map. Bill went and pull a gun out of his waistband. Got caught in his brace, actually. But anyway, you had a couple go. And uh, oh, then all of a sudden, it was, it was off. It kicked off. Well, then there was fights all over the joint. And one of the men, Dicky Hart, and he's firing a revolver. Well, how he never hit anyone, uh, one in the wall, one in the leg of a chair, what you're sitting on with one. And one of them hit a guy in the shoulder who was with us. And it burst an artery. And in seconds, he was sort of bleeding to death. You see him go. And I said to the man, oh, who I knew, see him with a gun, I knew it, he'd done it. I said, oh, drop it out, let's get him to the hospital. It's very bad to hurt. But in my mind was to get him. I have to say that because I really blamed him what he'd done. All right, he said. And two men, they picked him up one by his, you know, without hurting his shoulder, one on his legs. And um, I went in front of them, 
and they were in the middle and sticking out behind them. And each room I'm going through, and where it said exit, it went for about three. I'm looking for a weapon, anything. Until the last room, the next door was the door leading, the exit door out to the street, so this wouldn't be last chance. So when I hid behind the door, and as he came through, they had nothing of me. And I thought the power punch or anything like that, but for once I did give him a very good punch. Smashed him right in the mouth and with the other end pulled the gun down. But with that, he done it. And no one blew me leg off. And, you know, fractured, well, broke, shattered the bone completely. The fire bone. And the rest is history. The rest is the, the he, he, was found, he was found dead, that's mm-hmm. right. Shot by his own gun. The gun that uh, shot me. After the gun battle at Mr. Smith's, one man was dead and Eddie Richardson and Frankie Fraser had gunshot wounds. The rest of the Richardson gang were on the run. In the early hours of March the 7th, 1966, one of the first men on the scene was PC George Barker driving his Wolsey 610. I drove into Farley Road, which is um, which leads to the back entrance of uh, Mr. Smith's club, and it was like a battle scene. There was glass and blood. And we came across the body of Hart laying in the gutter, which was covered. I never actually went into the club proper, but on the right-hand wall was a great smear of blood, with, which looked like it had been smeared with a hand. And um, going from memory, um, I I just recall seeing it. It was obviously fresh because there were still vertical streaks of blood running down the wall. We found a pistol in the gutter and a big glass bar two inches by about one and a half, with a great lump of matted hair on it. Um, so we, we found a dustbin lid and covered those items. I think the, the operator I had with me picked up the gun. He, with his torch, then found a trail of blood, which we followed. And the blood ended at a house with a low garden wall with a privet hedge behind it. I stepped over the wall and uh, immediately trod on somebody there who moaned. And that was where I found Frankie Fraser, and the reason being that I'd accidentally trod on his leg. Fraser and the critically injured Dickie Hart were taken to nearby Lewisham Hospital. Doctors and nurses were unable to save Hart's life. He was in the next cubicle to me, Hart, in a casualty, as soon as you go in. I see him die, in fact. He was blown to pieces. It was a 45 shot through here, right the way up. Couple. About as near to me as I suppose you are across here, that line, same as this table is. And he was shot with what gun? His own gun? His own gun. Did you shoot him? Well, they said I did. But I was found not guilty. And quite rightly. Another gangland murder where nobody was convicted. Once again, the underworld called this justice. You know, the fellows who went with Miss Smith with that night to dead. They'd been murdered in all different circumstances. Dick, the girl got murdered in Miss Smith's. Peter and Missy got murdered at a boxing match. And Buttons got shot. This front door. Over a swindle, he was doing with someone, and they had the arm, went down, and knocked the door in the bush, with all the double barrel. So, that's the only man to left. Richardson's, um, they went to the powerhouse in London. He's into one night, they went into the club, and they found some rocks up right there. And I was one of them. And I'm proud to say I was one of them. Hayward's gang inadvertently did the police a good turn. The Richardsons were effectively off the streets. Eddie got five years for a fray along with Frankie Fraser. It was a major break for Jerry MacArthur, the assistant chief constable of Hertfordshire. Within a year, he had them all in the dock. He was starting to accumulate the evidence he needed. 
it was in October of 1965 that a man named Taggart came out to see me because he was frightened for his life. Jimmy Taggart, a long firm fraudster, went to Hertfordshire Police because he feared word would get back to Charlie if he went to the Met. Taggart told MacArthur Charlie Richardson and his men had taken him to this yard in Rotherhithe. He was then subjected to a five hour beating in order to collect a twelve hundred pound debt. He was obviously a man petrified. He was virtually shivering when he was speaking to me. He was terrified. And uh, I wanted to take a statement from him, a written statement, but he wouldn't give me that statement. He said he was frightened that maybe the Richardson somehow or other would get to know about it and he'd be in trouble again. Taggart told MacArthur about other victims of the Richardson's violence. Eventually, they struck a deal. Taggart would make a full statement but not sign it until Charlie Richardson and his gang were under arrest. All right, Mr. Taggart, you'd like to take a seat? Let's start. If MacArthur could not bring them to trial, then this statement and others he collected would be destroyed. Sit down whenever you think it's right. Tell me anything you need to know. Okay, hang on. Okay, you just want to come back. Immediately on getting into the office, I was thrown to the floor and the three of them began kicking me. They were swearing at me. Then my clothing was pulled from me and I was left lying on the floor completely nude. It's difficult to remember the sequence of events, but I can remember Fraser ripping me on the edge of the pole about two inches in diameter which broke in two. I was thrashed with ropes and hit on the head with a pair of pliers. While Fraser was attacking me with these objects, the others were kicking and punching me. MacArthur had originally planned to jail the Richardsons for their long firm frauds and extortion, but as Taggart's statement unfolded, he realised it would be easier to convict the gang on their crimes of violence. I can remember sitting on a chair on one occasion and seeing my reflection in a window and realising how bad I looked, and this made me more determined than ever not to become unconscious, as I thought if I did they would finish the job and kill me. These beatings happened in spasms. On some occasions I was made to wipe up my own blood which was on the walls and floor with a rag they gave me. Fraser's attitude was that I would be dangerous to release, and they should finish the job off and kill me. What's your version of what happened to, to Jimmy Tucker? He didn't get touched. You break a wooden pole over his head, hitting him so hard with it. Complete rubbish. Com absolute rubbish. Beaten up, kicked in the testicles, tied to a chair. Quoting his own evidence, after all this happened to him, this is his evidence, not mine, he drove up. He never went to hospital to have it x-rayed, the so-called fault fractured skull. Any other injuries, there was no record of them. And he never went to the police, the doctor about them, or anything. I think the doctor was a complete sham. I don't think he existed. His body was one mass of black and blue bruises. Hardly any space between one bruise and another, overlapping each other in actual fact. And his back was all stripes of uh, black and blue. All very close together. Not just lines going down. And down below, his testicles and his groin was all, you know, like a ball, rubber ball, the size of a rubber ball. Dr. McCallum saw Jimmy Taggart as he hid in a friend's house in North London a few days after his beating. He was a key prosecution witness at the main trial of Charlie Richardson and the rest of his gang at the Old Bailey. He vividly remembers Taggart's condition. I saw him in bed lying spread eagled. I was horrified at the 
uh, what appeared to be was a grotesque figure, all blown up, face all swollen, black and blue all over. He must have had a terrific beating, and an expert beating at that. Uh, he, he was grotesque, literally grotesque, but there were no serious, no actual serious injuries. And this was the incredible thing about it. The police began to realise there was a link between the fraudulent companies and the violence. The aim of the horrific beating was to make sure none of the frontmen in the long term frauds dared to name Charlie in court. The main architect of the frauds was Jack Duval. He built a pyramid of shady companies that kept money rolling in. But this brilliant con man went too far. He conned Charlie too. Jack knew him for what he was, and he still conned him. Charlie would just not take that. He'd, he'd give you money, but he didn't like being conned for it. If he went down to Charlie and said, Look, Charlie, I mean, shit, I need under pounds. What for, Johnny? Well, I'm in trouble with the police. Here's under the money back. But to be conned, he just couldn't take that. He's got a reputation to keep up. Now, people know he's been conned and he does nothing about it. Then they all start taking liberties. So he uh, put his foot down every time on it. Jack Duval vanished abroad when he knew the game was up. One by one, Charlie pulled in Duval's associates to find out where he was. Among those summoned to his Camberwell office was a man called Bunny Bridges. Bridges gets a message. He comes down the yard, but he doesn't dream. What was going on? I mean, he had done no wrong to Charlie, you know, right between us. And he came in and he got a smack in there and Charlie said to him, where is Jack Duval? I said, well, I don't know. What do you want him for? He said, well, he owes me five. And uh, he said, Bunny said, no, he hasn't seen him. Charlie sits behind the desk, just sort of sitting there like the Lord, you know, and you carry on till Charlie says, take him upstairs and make him tell him where Jack Duval is. So we took him up above the scrapyard, you've got some officers up there with the shoes. We fucked him about a bit, gave him a few smacks. Then we had what we called a torture box here, an old Phil telephone. We slung uh, Bunny in the bath of water, just pulled up. And he started putting the wires on him and turning the handle and he was screaming blue murder you know, about the pain that was going through him. You put the wires wherever you're going to put them on his prick or on his balls or whatever you're going to put them on his nipples and turn the handle. And the cold water doubles the strength of the shot that goes through you. What was his reaction? Well, he jumped about four foot in the bloody air out of the bar, screaming and shouting, you know, and you give him an arrow, then we put a tied a piece of cloth around his mouth and keep him quiet. Just carried on with the handle and that. And he could see that he didn't know nothing. I mean, he, he, he would have told us. It's obvious, you know, he couldn't take that all the time. I think you could honestly say, nine times out of ten, they didn't know nothing what was going on in the first place. They really got tortured for fuck all. Like Bridges, he didn't know nothing about Duval's if you knew that and you knew it at the time, why didn't you say, no, we're not going to take him upstairs? No, 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 there's not a thing. You've got all this to do, you do it. Otherwise, you're liable to wind up on the torture box as well. You don't say no to Charlie. These unspeakable acts are impossible to justify. For the police, the victims weren't ideal witnesses to put before a jury because they tended to be criminals. But MacArthur couldn't afford to wait. He was worried that the violence would escalate. They would put it, that they were a threat only to the underworld. But in reality, they're a threat to the public because they become power mad. They wouldn't hesitate to uh, dish out violence. And the violence was such that it could only be a perverted mind that was doing it or controlling it. And it was bound to lead in the end if it wasn't stopped, or if it hadn't already happened, it was bound to lead in the end to murder. Charlie Richardson believed he could get away with murder. In South Africa, he was named in a sensational trial. The victim was Thomas Waldeck, a mineral prospector who had persuaded Charlie to invest tens of thousands of pounds in a mining venture. Once again, Charlie began to suspect he'd been conned. 
The court was told a contract killer called Harry Prince had been sent to Johannesburg. Prince teamed up with Charlie's men on the spot. Prince took the gun, we went to Wardex's house, parked the car outside the house. We got up to the front door, the front door was glass, all glass. Prince rang the bell, the light came on, you could see Wardex standing behind her. Prince just said, well, I think it was about nine bullets he put into me. Heard Mrs. Wardex scream, done a duck with a car, got back to the house of Victory Park. About three days later, the police pulled us in, me and Prince, released us for lack of evidence. But the police said they knew it was Prince, because when they were sitting down, he was sweated so much and went through the sole of his shoes to the floor. Panicking. Harry Prince vanished. The Johnny Bradbury was tried for the murder and sentenced to hang at Pretoria's maximum security prison. He carried out his last orders for Charlie Richardson. When the trial ended in May 1966, Bradbury was put on death row to await the rope. His sentence was eventually commuted to life, and he served 11 years. How long were you actually on death row? Uh, uh, 10 months, 9 days. And were there people hanged while you were there? Oh yeah, I think it was about 80 blacks and 4 whites and myself, and all went. While Bradbury was on death row, British detectives flew down to see him. In statements, he confirmed crucial details about the torture and beatings and gave the police their first inside view of the Richardson's gang. On the day that England would beat Germany in the world, uh, football Cup final, a Saturday, at five o'clock in the morning, I briefed a team, I think it was of 60 officers, and out we I went and did our raids. Charlie was in bed, sound asleep. So we told him we were going to arrest him, and we searched his premises, and found indications of uh, fraud, passport offences, and things like that. But he would insist on sh shaving before he came away. And all the time I could see, he was thinking to himself, how am I going to get away from this? And in the bathroom when he was shaving, I said, to no, Charlie, forget it. We are not going to escape. We will make sure of that. Time has not dulled Johnny Bradbury's memory of his horrendous acts, nor has it sharpened his sense of morality. His little trace of remorse, just bafflement. But the things we done, I can't believe it myself sometimes, it was unreal. We could go and hit the bloke and put him on a torture box, or break his toes with a pair of flies, or pull his teeth out. It bothered us. Charlie had a bar around the yard, that was a... You know, we had a policeman there for a drink or with someone with talk, you can't sit there all night and dine at first. And then we used to have just a brandy or a whiskey we all drunk in. And just have a five minute smoke break and start again. It was a recognised thing. More like a factory, you know, on a tea break. Can't keep going on an empty stomach. We used to send round to army supply shop or what will we think, you know. <laughs> These men were so callous they took meal breaks while they tortured others. But the extent of their depravity goes beyond even this shocking detail. Many of their victims were drugged with a cocktail of alcohol and powerful sedative to make them passive. But this very passivity spurred Bradbury and his associates onto even greater acts of brutality. Charlie pulled some of that stuff. And he pulled a lot of it in there. The bloke now is a bit too in the car. Charlie gave him a smack. Frankie Fraser gave him a smack. 
And then I don't know what happened. As I said, I still can't explain it to this day. What made me do it? I said to Charlie, "You got any flies in your door?" He said, "Yeah." He said, "What are you going to do? Tell him to break his fucking toe? He won't tell us what's been going on." And Charlie gave me the flyers and you know got his toes and been in them this way and just snapped them off. And then he was in such a thing with his stuff that was in his drink, he didn't even feel the fucking pain. So then I got annoyed. I took the knife and then cut off his ear off. And then he was more or less unconscious with this drink stuff. So Charlie said to me and Roy, I'll just shove him in the car and dump him at the fucking hospital or somewhere. Which we did. We just took him in a and kicked him out and left him lying. I think they found him about three hours later in front of What was it? But I still can't tell you what made me turn vicious like that. So, I mean, it's different to putting a bloke on a torture box. You know, it's just turning an hand or it's more or less a big joke sort of thing. But when you get older, a pair of flies and break a bloke's toes, you know, just sit there doing it because you don't feel a funny thing. And that's when I knew I was going the other way then. In June 1967, a man had given the orders had to take some. Charlie Richardson was sentenced to 25 years for crimes of violence and demanding money with menaces. Eddie Richardson and Frank Fraser got 15 years apiece. Charlie expected the public to believe he'd been half done by. That people about they're trying to obtain my own money back. There was no other people's money involved here. I've never robbed a bank. I've never broken anybody's house. I've never robbed a security car. I've never blown anybody up with a bomb. I've never shot anybody with a shotgun. Yeah, you know, I've got 25 years in prison. You know, I don't know what society or what the authorities are trying to do with me. Society was making sure that gangsters got the message that they would no longer be allowed to get away with murder. The trial judge, Sir Frederick Lawton, is in no doubt that the punishment he gave Charlie Richardson fitted the crime. Press on looking for good uh, headline, described it as the torture case. In my opinion, there was a fair description. That's really what it was about, the use of torture to obtain concessions. I, in, by the time I tried the Richardson's, I'd been at the, at the law opposite for something like over, well over 30 years spending most of my time, but not all of it, in the criminal courts. I'd never come across anything like this before.